Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I know I was up earlier, but my name is Sean Jensen. I get the privilege of serving as a lead pastor here. And before we jump into our new series, I want to take a moment to talk about an opportunity we have here at Vail. Um, if you didn't know, I actually came from a church in Pontiac, Illinois, which is 35 minutes away. Uh, when me and my wife felt led to step into this position, we knew we would be stepping away uh, from a church we planted 10 years ago. And the VLT and myself, and as through prayer in this moment, we decided that as we move forward, that we want to do what whatever we can while they're in the search process for their new lead pastor to walk alongside and partner with Authentic Church. And so Pastor Kevin has gone over and preached. Pastor Corey has been over in Pontiac and preached. They got a little taste of where I'm from. I was like, you guys like that? Yeah. And, uh, and so we decided moving forward that in this season, while they're still in the process of searching for a new lead pastor, that we will actually be streaming this message in there for the time being until they find a new lead pastor. So could you do me a huge honor by saying hi to Authentic Church real quick and say, hey, we're praying for you. We appreciate you guys. My focus is here at Vail. I'm excited to get things rolling, but sometimes we got to lift other people's burdens. And so thank you, VLT, and everyone who actually cares about the Big C Church. And that's what matters to us. It's not just one church, it's many churches. And while you were clapping, we got to clap for one other people. And those are everyone else joining us online. Come on, let's give it up, and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us today. All right, now who's ready? I'm ready. Let's jump into this. All right, we're going to be in Matthew. This is a disciple of Jesus, and we're starting a series today for four weeks called Built Different, and I'm excited to break that for you, but the scripture we are going to look at is a disciple of Jesus, and Jesus actually has four gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and these are the stories of the life of Jesus, you know, and so Jesus actually doesn't die four times. It happens once, but from different perspectives. You're like, wow, you think he would know this by now, right? That's not, that's not what's happening. Uh, there's four perspectives, and one of the disciples named Matthew is writing this perspective, and he's actually talking about a moment where Jesus is changing this guy named Simon, a a disciple of Jesus named Peter. So his name is now Peter, and this is the moment in the exchange they have. And listen, this is going to be literally the rock statement that we're going to look at for the next four weeks. Matthew 16, 18 through 19 says, and I tell you that you are Peter. Everyone help me out. Say Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is a huge statement, but I just wanna ask the Holy Spirit to help me in this moment because I need his help. So Lord, I pray that you would help me in this moment, open our hearts to remind us what we are as the church. We love you. We're glad that we get to worship freely here. And we just pray that we would leave change. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, so just to help you out, when we say the word built different, if you're here and you're like, I kind of understand what that means. Anyone know what built different means? Can you show me with the way raise your hands? Built different, okay. I thought you wouldn't. So I went to stayhip.com so you could stay hip with your students. So this is what stayhip.com says about built different. I know, I'm making you cooler by the moment. So we're like, Sean, there's no hope for me. All right, all right, well, let's try this. Built different is a slang phrase used to indicate when an individual or thing is on another level. It also implies that the individual is fearless, elite, and thinks is an advanced manner. I know one of the parents said, so it's like off the hook. And your student's like, no, don't ever say that again. All right, like, it's built different. It's on a whole nother level. Let me just show you some examples of some people or some teams that were built different. The 85 Bears were built different. Anybody? Come on, I think we should thank the Bears for winning on Thursday. We got it. I think they should lose to get the number one pick again. And again, and again, all right? right, What about Michael Phelps? Michael Phelps was built different. I think 28 medals, 23 of them were gold medals. This dude literally is legit built different. He's like, his arms are designed to be a swimmer. How about the iPhone? Built different. Oh, there's a division in the room. There it is. We'll get back. Okay, let me just get everyone back on the same page. The Nokia 6110. Bill, you could drop this from a skyscraper, y'all. Literally, you could like chuck this at a robber's face who was trying to like rob you and in the same moment take the phone and then call 911 because it would be just fine. This thing was built different. Remember Snake on there? I can't get stuck on this, but I could talk a whole lot about that. How about the 1967 Shelby Mustang? Where are my car guys at? Any of my car guys? There it is. If you have one, email me. I'm gonna drive it. All right. How about moms? Moms are built different. Come on, husbands, let's celebrate. Come on, kids, let's celebrate. Oh, the single moms and our veterans. 
our veterans are built different. We're so grateful for them. So now you get an idea, right? They're built different. And so did you know that when we talk about the church of Jesus Christ, it is actually built different. Like when it comes to empires, when it comes to organizations, when it comes to throughout the years, what something has built, the church of Jesus Christ has been built different. It has withstand so much trouble, so much trial, so much persecution, and yet it is still the winning team. I don't know about you, but I like being on the winning team. Anybody else like being on the winning team? If if you are here and you're like, I would like to be on the winning team, let me invite you to the church that Jesus built because this thing is amazing. And so the next few weeks, we're going to show you why the church is built different and how we get to be a part of a winning team and why we can make a difference in those lives around us. And so today we're going to ask that question, what makes the church so different than anything else? Well, the first thing is, is the church is a body, not a building. The church is a body, not a building. It's actually not brick and mortar. It's body and muscle, right? That's why Jesus, when we look back at the scripture, when he's talking with Peter, he says, and on this rock, on this rock. Now, let me just take a moment to unpack this. On this rock, this was not Peter, even though Peter's name means rock. It actually was a statement that Peter made before. He says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And he goes on that statement, the statement that I am the son of God who came to restore Uh, the relationship between us and God. He goes, on that rock, I will what? I will build, who's? My church. So Jesus wants everyone to know that if you want a resilient construction, the church, you need a strong foundation. And the foundation is Jesus. You, how many people know that the foundation is the most important part when it comes to construction? And so Jesus wants everyone to know that if it's not built on Jesus, it will crumble. It will fall. Uh, I may give it a time. Every empire Every strong force throughout years and millennia has come crumbling down. We look back at Babylon. We look at Rome. We look at different countries. And listen, I love being a part of America. Of course, we pray for it. And even though we love being in America, we got to understand that even America does not stand up against the church of Jesus Christ. It is stable. It is sure. And it's something you want to be a part of. And so Jesus says, I will build mine. So first and foremost, when you understand this, We are not building Sean's church. We are not building our church. We're not building the world's opinions church. We are building Jesus's church. He's the foundation. Someone likes that. It's like, yeah, it's not your church, Sean. I agree with you. I'm just here to serve you. It's the best thing ever. So he says, I'm gonna build my church. So let's look at this word church. What does the word church mean? Well, this is the word ecclesia. Now, when you look at the word church, it actually comes from a German word called kirch. Uh, It's been transliterated, it's been moved a lot and all that. But when you look at the original Hebrew, or Greek, when Jesus said this, he said it 114 times in the New Testament. But this was the first moment that it was pronounced in the New Testament was from Jesus' words. It's the ecclesia, which means a called out assembly. And so what he's saying is this is a called out people group who have been called out and gather in a public place. This was shocking in this culture. It was a bunch of people who gathered together in a public place, no longer the temple. We'll talk about that in a second because some people are like, yep, that's exactly, you might be online, maybe you're here and you've heard someone say, that's exactly why I don't worship God in a building because the church is not a building, it is a place. I would like to encourage you to continue to read more of your scripture because Hebrews also says to not neglect the gathering of the believers. Just because we are the church doesn't mean we have blessings like this to gather as the church. Because God can do some powerful things when the church comes together and put their faith together. Sometimes we come in feeling down and discouraged, but the faith next to us somehow lifts us up. We have to learn that Jesus says we still need to gather together as the church. This doesn't mean that brick and mortar is not important. Praise God that we have a place where we can be called out And we can gather together, but we need to understand that the church is not going to stay in this building on a Saturday afternoon. It's actually going to leave this building on a Saturday afternoon because we are the church. Now, this was super shocking in this culture. And the reason why is because Jesus was predominantly talking to Jewish disciples and Jewish people. 
And the reason this is shocking is because for Jewish customs, they always travel to the temple to worship God. So if you look all the way back to the Old Testament, the Old Testament, you see the temple and the camp meetings and all these things. The temple actually housed the Ark of the Covenant or the presence of God. And so they would actually set up a temple and they would go to this place. And only certain people could go so far in. And that's where they would worship. And so, and so this tent would always stay in place, but it would move from here and there every once in a while. But everyone went to that place. And so when Jesus starts talking about a called out assembly, they're confused because they go to a church. And so now that he's saying it's a public thing, they're actually kind of like, what is going on? And so what happens in the New Testament is Jesus is actually foreshadowing to what's going to happen. And what Paul actually talks about in the church of Corinth, he actually kind of adds on to Jesus' words and he causes something so shocking that people would say, I can't believe this is true. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. He says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, here it is, and you are that temple. Now, before you look at your wife and say, she's a brick, don't do that. <laughs> but you can look at each other and say, you're a temple. Come on, look at someone and say, you're a temple. Don't make it weird, all right? You don't do it. Jesus is saying, listen, in the Old Testament, the temple had to be where sacrifices were. But because Jesus died on the cross, he was the sacrifice for our sins. He says, when we put our trust in him, he cleanses us. And because we are cleansed, guess what? The Holy Spirit can live in us. And now that the Holy Spirit lives in us, he goes, the church has now become mobile. You don't have to travel to a temple anymore. No, no. The church now travels to other people. This is super important for us to understand why we're talking about built different. Because today it's built different than the early temple. Jesus says, no longer one temple, we got many temples. We house the Holy Spirit if we are in Christ. And so it's not about us traveling to a place, but the people who won't travel to this place, we get to take the temple to them. This is super important to understand because we have to understand that the temple, the presence of God that lives in us, isn't meant just to stay in this room. We actually get to take it to other people. And so Jesus is saying a called out assembly, no longer one temple, but you are the temple of Christ and you have that authority and that power and people are waiting for you to come in contact with them. I don't know about you, but I've heard people say this a lot and this is a good statement by the way, but I just wanna kind of unpack it a little bit more. But have you ever said something like this? If I could just get, insert name, to church, right? Come on, we have someone in our life that we would love to experience church some of you come here and you're like, man, I, I, this place has changed my life. The message has changed my life. The worship has changed my life. The community has changed my life. If I could just get this person to church, I know that everything will change. Listen, this is a great statement. And some of you are thinking about someone right now. I want you to take a moment and think about this person. They might be at your job place. Uh, they might be a student at your school. It might be someone you come in contact with through your routine, Walmart pickup or Aldi pickup or Fresh Dime pickup or Hy-Vee pickup or wherever you go. You got a name here, right? All right, think about this. Every time I hear someone say, if I could just get blah, blah, blah to church, listen, that's important. Get an invite card, invite people to church, don't stop. But here's my question for you. Every time we were in contact with that person this week, they were already at church. What were they experiencing? If I could just get them to church, oh, they had four church experiences this week. What were they experiencing? Oh, they hit up your social media five times this week. What were they experiencing? Oh, that sits good, doesn't it? Because some of us are waiting till Sunday and some of us are waiting till Saturday. And he's saying it's important, yes, to get them to church. But listen, when we are the church out there, we will run out of room in here. We got to be the church out there if we expect people to come into here. But what do we say? We say, come on, I'll see you on this week. And he's like, why don't you just love me on Wednesday? Why don't you just bless me on Tuesday? So Jesus is saying, I'll tell you why we're built different because it's not just going to the temple one day a week. We are the temple every single day of the week. And what would change if we actually remember that the people that we wish we got to church, they were already at church when they experienced you. When you're at the family gathering, guess what? Bring church. When you go back to your school, it's time to bring church. 
Remember, remind yourself that you can be a person that God wants to use to bring church to that person this week. Because when you do, I believe it will change everything in this room. We gotta remind ourselves we're built different because we are a body, we're not a building. But we also have to remember that we're, not, we're also, the church is a battleship, it's not a cruise ship. Anybody like cruises in here? Who likes to go on some cruise? Ever been on a cruise? I'm not bashing cruises, so don't hear me wrong. But listen to what Jesus says about this thing. He goes, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So I'm gonna build my church and the gates of Hades, all right? So this is actually really cool. I'm not gonna unpack it today, but while we were in Israel this past uh, summer, we actually got to go to the place that they say is the gates of Hades. So they did ungodly things here, wicked things, uh, sacrificed terrible things. And the cool thing is, is that while we were there, actually Pastor Ted, who was the former pastor here, was preaching about the gates of Hades behind him, this wicked, corrupt, ungodly place. And he says, Jesus said that the church will actually overcome this place, which is so cool that the church is still growing, but the gates of Hades in Israel is no longer being used, that Jesus' words have already taken place. But what's so cool is that Jesus says this word. See, gates is already a defensive mechanism. And so he says, the gates will not overcome it. So Jesus is saying, if the gates are a defense mechanism, then what does that mean the church should be doing? going on the offense. He's saying the church, it's not, it's not a cruise ship. It's actually a, it's a battleship. We're, we're advancing. We're, we're moving forward. We're not just sitting back. We're, we're not retreating when it gets dark. We're not running when it gets hard. We're not hiding when it gets crazy. We are actually built for this moment today. It always blows my mind how many Christians go and hide when the world gets dark. I'm like, that's why we live here on earth. I tell people all the time, if, if God wanted you in heaven as soon as you got saved, we would no longer be here. But the fact that we are still here means we still must have a work to do here on earth. And so he says, maybe it's like being a battleship, not a cruise ship. Now listen, what's the difference? Well, when you look at a cruise ship, cruise ships are designed to actually retreat from the world, right? Get some retreat, get some pleasure. Maybe you take the kids. If you take the kids, it's not a vacation. How many people know this? Like, we always say this, when we take the kids, we're going on a trip, when it's just me and my wife, now we're on vacation, right? Anybody else? But, but when you go on a cruise ship, what happens? It's for pleasure. Everyone serves you. You're waited on. I'm waited on. And we retreat from our stresses and our troubles. And I want to be very clear. I am not saying you can't come to church and experience God's peace. I am not saying there's moments where we can't experience God's rest in here. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is church is more like a battleship. Why? Because it's equipping soldiers to leave this place to make a difference in this world. And so a cruise ship might be something like, hey, cater to me. A battleship says, hey, give me some weapons. I will fight on behalf of God. And so he wants to remind us that there's a position on this battleship. There's a place to get involved. Listen, it's hard to actually enjoy a battleship sometimes. Now, can you have fun on a battleship? Absolutely. But the prime focus of a battleship is to advance and to move forward and to protect. And so he gives the church spiritual weapons. We got prayer. We got worship. We got God's word. But also we can serve and we have his love. And so a lot of times what we do is we, we retreat. And I, I want to be very careful how I say this, but I think the church has done a, a lot of people a disservice by creating a consumer culture. Because the church actually was never supposed to just meet our needs. God wants to use us to meet the world's needs. You see, the church founded on Christ is the hope of the world. And so sometimes we kind of treat this place like a cruise ship. Now it's easy. Those donuts out there are great. Come on, someone, I eat them all the time. I got snacks that is grabbed from every room. Like, there's snacks in this room too? All right. Coffee, it's free, and we want you to enjoy it. But what I'm telling you is that the prime reason for today is to equip all of us to be the church when we leave this place. And I think about this because 
when you look at culture and you look at everything that's happened, there's this guy named Tom Holland. Now, I'm not talking about Spider-Man. Some of you are like, ooh, Tom Holland? Tell me about him. Not this guy, all right? Tom Holland is actually a um, historian, and he was an atheist, and he actually vehemently spoke against Christianity. And so as he began to search things out in history and look back, he began to see substantial and crazy evidence that actually led to him now being a Christian. And while he was in this like phase, he actually had this quote that was absolutely amazing. He was writing a book and he was looking back at all like the civilizations and everything that has happened. And he says something super unique that I think we need to look into. Now it's a little long and a little lengthy, but this is absolutely amazing to hear. An atheist now turned Christian who looked back at history and saw what the church did. This is what it says. While studying the ancient world, Holland writes, he realized something simply, the ancients were cruel. Yeah, and their values utterly foreign to him. The Spartans routinely murdered imperfect children. The bodies of slaves were treated like outlets for the physical pleasure of those with power. Infanticide was common. The poor and the weak had no rights. How did we get from there to here? It was Christianity, Helen writes. Christianity revolutionized sex and marriage, demanding that men control themselves and prohibiting all forms of rape. Christianity combines sexuality with monogamy. It is ironic how it notes that these are now the same standards for which Christianity is now derided. Christianity elevated women. In short, Christianity utterly transformed the world. Y'all, where we are today is because the message of Jesus Christ. He looked back and realized that actually the antidote and the cure and the things that made things better was a bunch of people who took this thing to heart and advanced. They did not retreat. And so we see the church looking back. They actually started the hospitals. The first hospitals came from the church. Colleges came from church because they wanted to educate people. Welfare programs started from the church. We see all these amazing things taken out. Did you know that even to this day, that literally the church worldwide is the biggest donations and donors that give to charity in any form? So before people make you feel bad that they say, well, I wish the church would just step up and said the screaming these things. No, they have stepped up. The church did step up. Actually, the world we are enjoying is probably being enjoyed because a bunch of Christians realize we need to stop hiding from the dark and we need to start shining light in the dark. And if we have that mentality, I wonder what else God could do in Bloomington Normal and beyond. He says, it's not, it's not a cruise ship. It's, it's a battleship. And listen, there is a position God is waiting for you. The church is built different. The last thing is this. The church is a hospital. It's not a museum. The church is a hospital. It's not a museum. This is super important to understand because if you look at museums, museums are clean. They're orderly. I always get in trouble at museums because I'm too loud of a person. Everyone's like, shh. I'm like, you shh. And then I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm a pastor. I shouldn't say that. It's like, you shouldn't say that because you're a Christian. I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's right. Museums are so clean, they're so orderly, everyone comes and listen, they attract just a specific type of group, right? What's different about a hospital is they're messy and they're chaotic sometimes. And it doesn't matter how much money we have or how little money we have. It doesn't matter what color our skin is. It doesn't matter how we've been raised and where we have been. Everyone goes to the hospital. It's something about the hospital that brings all walks of life together. It's in a time of crisis that brings all the people together. What's so cool is Jesus wants the church to remember that the church was never supposed to be a museum of statues and clean, orderly. Jesus knew what he was starting when he started a church. He knew it was gonna get messy. He knew it was gonna get chaotic. If it hasn't gotten messy in a while, I wanna ask maybe, are we even doing church? Are we even reaching people? Because reaching people was messy. You know how I know? Because I'm messy. Anybody else? Am I the only messy person in this room? Meeting people is messy. And and so he says, this is going to take work. And and I love this because Jesus actually says, if you don't like this moment, Jesus actually talks about this. There's this moment in Scripture that we're going to unpack for a second. And Jesus is actually addressing the Pharisees and the church leaders at this time who actually were in the church. They were all around the church. They knew the church lingo. They knew how to speak church. They knew all the five books of the, the, five books of the first um, of the Bible. They knew how to say the right things and look the right way. They knew how to put their nose up. And they could go through all the motions. They were part of the club. They were the Pharisees, the teachers of the religious law. 
and no one really got along with them. And they had an issue with Jesus once. And so Jesus is actually talking to them. And this is what he says. And then I'll unpack it in a second. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and in need to repent. So check this out. So it says, Jesus answered them. Okay, Sean, who's them? Well, that's the Pharisees. That's the Sadducees. That's the religious teachers. Now, in this moment, let me tell you what's happening. This is great. So in this moment, Matthew has now followed, is following Jesus, the one who's writing this book. And Matthew's got friends. Matthew was a tax collector, y'all. Jesus calls a tax collector. Now, I know that doesn't make sense, but what tax collectors would do is they would actually collect tax for the Roman government. But here's the worst part about it. They would actually tax you a little bit more so they could pocket some of that too. So Jesus already has some disciples with him. And now he's saying, hey guys, guess what? I found someone else to be a disciple. And I can imagine, oh, who is, I can't wait to meet him. This is gonna be amazing. And then Matthew shows up. They're like, we don't want him. Send him back. And so Matthew starts following Jesus. And when Matthew starts following Jesus, he throws a party because that's what he does. So he goes, I want to I wanna host you. I want to invite you over. I'm going to invite all my friends over, everyone I know. Now, this could be anyone. He was a tax collector. This could be anybody. So you've got to imagine Jesus at this place with a bunch of people who don't talk like church people, right? I'm telling you, they probably drank a little bit more than they should have. They were like saying words that would make Joe Rogan blush. Like that was probably what was happening in this moment. They're probably bringing some stuff out, talking about specific things, crude, all this stuff happening. And Jesus is sitting at that table and he's eating with them and he's having some wine with them and he's talking with them. And the Pharisees see this and they don't like it because from that time they say, what are you doing? We separate ourselves from that. Now I understand that yes, there are some habits and some attitudes and things that we separate ourselves from. But Jesus is trying to say is, we need to sit at these tables and we need to understand that we are not gonna retreat because Christ has put something in us so that we can advance. And so he's sitting at this table and they, they call them scum. They say, why do you eat with such scum? That's what happened before this moment. And Jesus says to them, healthy people don't need a doctor. It's so simple. But sick people do. Jesus doesn't, neglect the sickness that's around the table. It reminds me, a lot of people, when we started our church before I came here, we had a lot of people. If you're leading a church and the religious people are getting mad, but people are getting saved, you're probably doing it right. Now, I'm not saying that we kick people out the door. I'm just saying that sometimes when you try to sit at tables and speak to people, other people don't really enjoy it. So I remember this one time, we were portable church, and as we were portable church, we met in a junior high. And so we had all the chairs out, and I'm preaching, I'm sweating, I'm young, I'm like 27. So I'm just, yeah, I'm getting, I'm probably not even saying things, it's probably heretical, I don't even know. But anyways, I had a heart, right? And I'm preaching, and I'm saying this thing, and as I'm preaching, I see a little puff of smoke go up in the air. And I was like, did we put hazers in the crowd? That's pretty neat, that's awesome. So I just keep preaching, keep preaching. As I'm preaching, I see another puff and I'm like, what is going on? Like four or five times, the cloud just gets bigger and bigger. And sure enough, while I'm preaching, some guy's just vaping right there in the junior high and he's just enjoying it. He's just like, smells like bubble gum. Like he's just, and he's just blowing it up into the air. Like this is great. And I remember having those talks with those people. I remember when we were in rooms and I was talking with someone, as I was talking with someone, someone walks past us and they look at me and go, did you smell that? I'm like, smell what? They said that. I'm like, what is that? I was like, oh, that, like, yeah. Do you think they smoked that before they came in? I was like, I don't know. I'm just glad they came in. Because sometimes what we do is we say, let me check your club membership card at the door before you come in. And what happens is we become church. Please think of it this way. One of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm at the gym and there's a bunch of guys who take selfies in the mirror, and maybe that's you. We're glad that you're here. <laughs> and, uh, 
And they're the same ones that they see these people come to the gym, right, for the first time, and they're unhealthy, and they're, they're out of weight, and they're already nervous about coming, and they're kind of looking around. They don't even want to get on the machine, and maybe you're scared to even go and, because they feel like they're going to do it wrong, and they jump on the machine, and they do it wrong, and there's these people like, ho, 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 after taking a selfie in the mirror, like, look at these guys, right? And, and I've heard people say, yeah, they'll be gone in a week. This is, the, this is the, the crowd that will be gone in a week, and you hear things like, look at that, they don't even know how to use the machine, and I, one of my biggest pet peeves, like, it, there's this guy named Joyce Wool, like, he would have your bag. Like, he would just be like, no, we don't talk like that about people. And, and what breaks my heart is when I'm in there, I remember when I was 45 pounds heavier, and I didn't know what a machine did. I remember how I felt. And I remember going in there and seeing everyone else who looked like they were in shape, and they had huge muscles, and they knew how to use the row machine just right, and they were running, and they were sprinting. Some guys had these Bane masks on, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on? Like, they're going to eat me alive, right? I'm just like, uh, I don't fit in here, right? This, I don't fit in. Look at me. I'm, I'm unhealthy. Uh, I have bad acid reflux. I don't even know how to live. I'm like putting this on, and there's a guy with a Bane mask who's hunting me down. Like, I'm like, this is not my people. And sure enough, I, I realized I had to keep leaning in. I had to keep leaning in. And what happens so many times is just like in this moment, Jesus is saying, you have turned into Pharisees, these people in the gym who look around and going, they don't know how to quote that verse just right. (laughs) Oh, look at where they fell. They're taking their selfies in the mirror, talking to each other, making fun of the people. And my heart is always going, wouldn't it be nice to be the person who would just walk up to those people and said, hey, let me show you how to use this machine. Hey, I remember when I was where you were at. I remember my first time at the gym. I was scared. Can I sit with you? Can I, can I show you how to lift that before you break your back? No, really, let me show you, right? Uh, maybe instead of saying, oh, they'll be gone in two weeks, how about we say, you know what? I hope this lasts forever. But how many times do we do that with church people? No, oh, I saw them last week. They won't be here very long. Oh, I know how they talk. Oh, they've been here before. Right? Jesus is saying, aren't unhealthy people supposed to be at the gym? Like, isn't that the whole premise of a gym? It's for people to come and get healthy. He says the church is the same way. We shouldn't be looking down on people who are coming in for the first time. We should be saying, this better last more than two weeks. This is gonna last better than four weeks. You know what? You having trouble reading your scripture? You having a little bit of trouble with your form? Let me sit next to you. Let me show you how to get some form in. Let me teach you how to memorize some scripture. Let me show you what this looks like. Oh, you're having a tough time with your kids too? Trust me, me too. Oh, you're nervous walking in for the first time? It's okay. I know you have a lot going on. I remember my first time coming in here and I was uncomfortable. Can I sit with you? Can I walk with you? Can I encourage you? I want I wonder how many more people would have great church experiences if we stopped looking away from them, but we remembered our first time coming to church, and we said, let me walk alongside of you. Why? Because, listen, the church is not a museum. It's a hospital. You can bring your wounds in. You can bring your daddy issues in. You can bring your depression in. You can bring your anxiety in. You can bring your hurts in and your pains in. You can bring everything you are into this place. Why? Because I know a Savior who is a doctor, and if you are sick, he can heal you. If you are hurting, he can make you whole. So I'm not going to push you out. Church, let's be a church that says, you know what? I don't care what they've been through. I don't care what the report said. I'm not going to be shocked by who walks in these doors. I'm going to say, yes, this is a hospital, not a museum. And we should celebrate that people are comfortable bringing their wounds to this church. That's the kind of church we need to be. And maybe you're here and you're like, I I didn't know that's this type of church. Well, welcome. This is a church where you should be at. Jesus says, hey, this isn't a museum, this is a hospital. And then he ends with this scripture with Peter. He says, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of Hades aren't gonna prevail. But don't forget, Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now, this might be a lot of weird things for you if you're new to church. But when you look at the word kingdom, it's a really way that Jesus signifies the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is is purpose, it's peace, it's joy, it's everything God wants to bring to us. We get when we receive Christ. And there's the kingdom of darkness. And Peter actually would be the first person who preaches and 3,000 people would follow Jesus after he dies and rises again. So he says, I'm giving you the keys. I'm giving you the authority. Now, have you ever had a key that you didn't know where it went to? You're just like, I got this key, but I don't know which door this goes to. There are a lot of people in the church who God has given keys that they don't know how to use. 
And the keys represent authority. The keys are actually saying, I have given the church something to be able to unlock heaven in people's lives and lock up hell in other people's lives. We have the authority to unlock freedom and lock up addiction. We have the authority to unlock peace and joy and lock up anxiety and depression. Man, we have the authority to lock up sickness and disease and unlock healing and wholeness. That's what the church has. We have access to the kingdom of heaven. And he says, when you understand the authority we have as a church, and we begin to realize that we, we're not a building, but we're a people who have the Holy Spirit living in us. Man, I'm gonna tell you what, we will be advancing. We will be moving forward. And when we are the church out there, we'll run out of room in here. I just want to remind you today that you, you have the keys. God's given you keys to pray over people, to pray with people, to speak into people. Did you know that we can walk in the rooms and bring peace to chaos? Oh, the holidays are coming up. And I still want to be with my in-laws. Well, maybe God wants you to be with your in-laws because you have keys that they don't have. Now, I know there's boundaries. I know you have to do your thing. But what if we stop retreating and we start advancing this fall? And we say, you know what? I'm not just gonna tell people I'm a Christian. I'm gonna stop. Can I give you a little bit of thing before we pray? Here's your new application. Stop telling people we're Christians. Because if we're actually being a Christian, you wouldn't have to tell them, they'll tell you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We pray, Lord, that we would be like you. Lord, there's so many people in here um, who need this message, not because they need to be the church, but because maybe they didn't know if they were coming to a place who would see them. But Lord, they came to the right place because this is a place that they can come and they can bring whatever they're going through. Thank you for your grace, Lord. I don't even deserve to be on this platform, but because of your grace, because of your healing power, because of who you are, Lord, I'm able to serve in this season. And I pray that's exactly what we'll do. We'll just serve those around us. We'll just be equipped to take care of those around us. Help us to be the church, to not just keep what is here in this place, but to take it wherever we go. Help us to look for moments, Father God, to unlock peace in people's lives, to unlock hope in people's lives, to unlock joy in people's lives. But we love you and we thank you for it. If you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, I just introduce you to Jesus. Jesus built his church. And if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can start a relationship with him right today. Scripture says if you believe that he is the son of God, that he died for you, for our sins, he was our savior. And you put your trust in him and you confess with your mouth, you can be saved. And listen, you get to be on the winning team. If you wanna be on the winning team, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You can say, Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Forgive me of my sins. I put my faith, I put my hope, and I put my trust in you. I wanna follow you. I want to be on the winning team. I want you to help me in my struggles. I want you to help me through my pain. And I want you to give me life and a purpose. Reveal those things to me by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.